more at the same time. Um, before we go to the meet, let me quickly connect my laptop to see if anything useful happens. That is not the case. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, if it connected, maybe it comes on. Um, before we do that, so this morning I talked a little bit about ways to beam split meta waves. How can I make an atom take both waves at the same time, right? Now we have that technology, we can start forming atom interferometers. So how do we do that? Um, let me draw a diagram where this is a spatial coordinate, for example, the vertical coordinate, and that's not crucial for now. And this is time. Okay? And the atom comes along, not moving for now. For now, I'm even neglecting gravity, okay? And at time t equals zero, I fire my laser pulse. In the spirit of this morning's lecture, these are really two laser beams coming from opposite sides, but I'm leaving out those details and I just draw a big line for the laser pulse. There's one important assumption I've made, the speed of light is very large. So I draw this as a straight vertical line, the laser beam is everywhere at the same time. In reality, of course, this isn't perfectly true. And some subtle details about using atom interferometers for detecting gravitational waves would depend on the time delay, but for now I'm going to ignore it. Okay? At this moment, the atom has a chance of continuing on or of being kicked up. Okay. Now I want to bring these two parts back to interference. So what I have to do is I have to fire the laser once more. This time I'm firing a pi pulse. Okay. So this was a pi over two pulse. It creates a superposition of the two states. This is a pi pulse. What it does is it acts like a mirror. The moving part of the superposition will be brought to rest, and the not moving part will be kicked up so that they merge, right? And at this point, I'm firing my pulse again, this time a pi over two pulse. So the part that was up going here, that looks like my laptop, that looks really good. Okay. Looks like my screensaver. We have to show the screensaver and not the slides. <coughs> That's what uh, Murray and I were debating. We <laughs> tried to go to presentation. Okay, that works. I think not a slide for now. This is not important. Okay. So let's say we are looking at the part of the wave function that moves up. At this point, it has a 50% chance of keeping going up or of being brought to rest. Right. The one that was not moving has a 50% chance of staying at rest or a 50% chance of getting kicked up. Now I'm placing a detector here and I ask myself, what's the overall probability of the atom to make it from here to here and not here? Right? Overall, we don't create or annihilate atoms, so if the atom doesn't come out here, it must come out there and vice versa. So let's see. It has two ways of getting there. Um, one way is taking the lower route, and the other one is taking the higher route. Right? So there are two wave functions arriving at this point. Psi 1 and Psi 2, where Psi 1 is the one that took the upper path, Psi 2 is the one that took the lower path. Right? The population at this point would be the absolute square of the coherent sum Let's also say that these two wave functions have the same magnitude but just a different phase. Then this one will turn out to be cosine squared of delta phi over 2, where delta phi over 2 is the phase difference between the two meta waves accumulated between this point where they were separated and this point where they were brought to interference again. So this is all very much an analogy to a light interferometer. The only difference is we're talking about matter waves, and so we have to talk about how do I calculate the phase difference between matter waves, right? There are several approaches. Um, note first that 
The atomenter parameter is useful when the phase difference is very large, because that gives us this enormous lever arm, right? That means those spatial paths are very much longer than the wavelength of your um, matter wave. Those paths are hundreds, thousands, millions, even billions of deployed wavelengths long. And this means that the matter waves are very well described by plane wave approximation. <coughs> this plane wave approximation we know from standard quantum mechanics course is the WKB method. Right? So one way of calculating delta phi is simply to use the WKB method. The simple WKB method says that the wave function looks something like p to the i over h bar integral p dx, where p is the momentum as function of time, and dx is the time, uh, the space interval. Right? You see this expression. This works sometimes, but sometimes isn't general enough because in the atom interferometer, the internal energy of the atom may change. Okay. So this would be a phase change that's not simply reflected in this part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. Okay, I want to rewrite this in a way that makes it easy to keep track of the energy level changes. So I need to calculate the integral p dx. Right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that dx is the classical velocity of the particle times dt. We are strictly semi-classical here, so by the standards of the quantum many-body entanglement people, this is quantum mechanics. Okay, so that turns me, turns it into an integral <coughs> p times v dt. Okay. Now this. WKB approximation is an approximation for the time independent wave function, but I want the time dependent wave function, and all I need to do is to tag along a factor i over h bar integral energy dt. Right? And I haven't changed this at all. That's nice. So I'm now at i over h bar integral p times v minus energy dt. Now let's generalize this a tiny bit and let's say the energy is not necessarily constant. This is really the classical Hamiltonian of the particle that I have. And let's um, make this three dimensional so these quantities get vector arrows and there's a dot product in here and you have seen this expression before p dot v minus the Hamiltonian that is nothing but the Lagrangian of the particle. So long story short the phase is calculated by i over h bar times the classical action along this path. Okay. I want delta phi which means I want the action on the upper path minus the action on the lower path. So sometimes I can write this as delta phi equals i over h bar line integral L dt, where by the line integral I mean I integrate along the upper path minus the integral along the lower path. That's a nice nifty expression. Um, has several nice properties. One nice property is that it is Lorentz invariant, so I'm not in trouble with relativity here. And that's not the whole story. Whenever the atom absorbs a photon, the phase of the photon gets added to the phase of the matter wave. You can see this easily when you treat the atom-photon interaction in perturbation theory, right? There's a matrix element E dot D, and the electric field carries a phase, obviously. Okay? So this is only part of the phase, and it's the part of the phase that I'll denote delta phi f, where the f stands for free evolution, that is the phase accumulated by the atom in between the laser pulses. The total phase difference 
would be delta phi equals delta phi f plus the sum of all the relevant laser phases. Okay? Meaning, the upper arm, for example, gets kicked here, so I might define this one as z equals zero. And I might say, by convention, my photon phases are all zero at z equals zero. Okay? So my photons all propagate by e to the i k z. So that their phase is zero when z equals zero. That's my convention. You could pick a different one, but that's what I'll take, right? So this first interaction has zero photon phase. This second up kick has zero photon phase. I <coughs> Here the wave packet gets kicked down, okay? So the upper arm gets a down kick, which means I add a negative photon phase contribution, and it is given by the photon wave number times this distance, and so on. So this is pretty boring. You can do it, I can do it, right? I'll just tell you the result in the end. But this is the important way of how to calculate this phase. Now I've derived it, and maybe from the WKB method, because that's what um, most physicists are familiar. You could have arrived at this in a different way. You could have taken a path integral approach. The final path integral is equivalent to the Schrodinger equation, where the wave function is really obtained by considering all paths not just the classical path, and each path contributes with an amplitude that's given to e to the i times the phase, and that phase is again given by the action. Okay? Now, if you say my particle propagates mostly on the classical path, then the path integral representation reduces to this expression, essentially. It's an alternative way to approach Perhaps the physically most satisfying way to arrive at this expression, however, is to realize that if I want a Lorentz invariant result, then there's really only one quantity that can determine the um, phase of a scalar particle, which is the proper time. So the relativistic action is nothing but the proper time elapsed on the path times the mass of the particle. Okay? So I would get the same thing here. This would be a low energy approximation to the proper time, as you learn in classical mechanics. Anyway, let's not get into that too much. Let's just say this is the way we calculate phases. We accept it. And let's consider a couple of atom interferometers. So, um, my very first example for an atom interferometer was this one here. There's a classical analogy. If you build a similar arrangement out of laser beams, it would be called a Mach-Zener atom interferometer. The, uh, it would be called a Mach-Zener light interferometer. The analogy, this would be called the Mach-Zener atom interferometer. Christian Bourdais likes to call it the Bourdais Jew interferometer, but not even Jew calls it that, and he is not a modest man. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the math singer. So, what are our phases? Now, let me point out the high symmetry of this arrangement, right? Both paths have a moving part, it moves for the same time duration. That's called a big T, the pulse separation interval. It's an important quantity. Both move at the same velocity for the same amount of time. Both are at rest for the same amount of time. It's a highly symmetrical configuration. Right? And so it might not surprise you that the phases here turn out to be zero. Okay? So delta phi free evolution here is zero, and delta phi laser is also zero for this configuration. Now this is kind of boring because there's nothing acting on the atom. So let me turn on gravity and let me make this atom fall. Now, 
not looks like this. I've done nothing but turning on gravity. Okay. How do I calculate the phase in this case? Well, first I solve the classical equations of motion for the particle to get these trajectories as function of time. And then I insert into the equation that was here, meaning I evaluate the classical action and I evaluate the laser phases at the points of interaction, right? If I do this, then the free evolution phase is still zero, but the laser phase is not. It's now k, that's the photon wave number, times g, that's the acceleration at which it falls, times the path separation times squared. And that's the usefulness of the mass zehner atom interferometer as a measurement of um, gravity. The k here to insert, this morning we said these are mostly two photon transitions, right? But they could be several photon transitions, for example, Bragg diffraction with 10 photons, right? In that case, I would get an n here. And the little n symbolizes the number of photons that the atom interacts with in each piece of paper. So very often the little n will be two, sometimes it will be more. Rarely it will be one. Okay? So that's the Maxander atom interferometer measures gravity. Um, because this is interesting, we will also point out where the zero comes from. The zero in the free evolution phase is really the cancellation of two terms, the first being the kinetic energy in the Lagrangian and the second the potential energy. So you see that the um, part of the wave function that is higher on average and therefore has a higher potential energy also moves more, right? It has to go all the way up and come back down. So it has to have a higher kinetic energy also. And the Lagrangian is T minus V, so those two cancel. Okay. If you calculated them one by one, then they would look like NKGT squared minus NKGT squared. And this would come from the kinetic energy, and this would come from the potential energy. The funny thing is you would get apart from perhaps a side error, the correct result if you calculated only one of those three terms and forgot the other two. Okay? The reason for that is the high symmetry of the mass zehner atom interferometer. What's that good for? You can use it to measure gravity. That's pretty much all there. Yeah? So is the fact that the free evolution phase is zero just telling you that gravitation is a conservative force? It's a conservative force. Is, is the free, fact that the free evolution is zero just a reflection of the fact that gravity is a conservative force and the work done over a closed path is zero? That's possible, but I can't think on my feet so fast. So that, what you say doesn't strike me as wrong, but I don't know how to prove it. Okay, so let's, let's add an emphatic perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I should say that, so I usually blame it on the symmetry, um, but that's perhaps the same statement. Let me show you an atom interferometer where the free evolution phase is not zero. We have to make it less symmetric, right? And that would be called the Ramsey Bourdais interferometer, and Christian Bourdais also calls it the Ramsey Bourdais interferometer. Um, now we have one part of the wave function not moving and a higher pi over 2 pass, okay? Kicking it up, I fire another pi over 2 pass, okay? What happens? So the first thing that happens is the same as here. The moving part will come to a rest, but it's a pi over 2 pass, so I'm going to split the lower part of the wave function. Okay. Then after another time, I fire a third pi over 2 let me take this upper part down, and then finally, when I'm done, fire pi over 2 pulse number 4, and again, I have two ways for the atom to arrive here or here. But 
I have now generated the population here, and here, and here, right? So I have these useless outputs of the interpolator, and here. There are two useful outputs and four useless outputs. Okay? Depending on, so the first thing to realize is that those outputs don't touch each other, so they don't interfere. So they contribute background noise when I detect my atoms, if they overlap with the interfering parts of the population. Right? But they do not contribute interference fringes, so for now I'm going to ignore them. Okay? Now let's calculate the phase here. Delta phi f. The free evolution now contains a contribution of the kinetic energy, right? So the momentum here is m times h bar k. That's the momentum at which I'm moving up. Okay? And energy is momentum squared over 2m. You can't really read this, right? It's askew, so let me turn it around. H bar k times n squared over 2m. That's the kinetic energy here. And this one times the time of flight t. And over h bar is the contribution of this piece of the trajectory to the free evolution phase. Right? So that would be here, h bar k squared over 2m times a factor of n squared, 1 h bar cancels <coughs> times t. But I have a second section here where the kinetic energy is the same and the duration is the same. So that gives me a factor of 2 here. Now let's do a little bit of cosmetics here. Let me introduce an abbreviation, omega recoil, I call h bar k squared over 2m. Okay. That would simplify this. I would now have n squared, 2n squared omega recoil t. Note that I'm defining the recall frequency with a factor of 2 here. Some people use a different convention of a factor of 2 here, whatever. Okay. Um, actually, I don't have a 2. shouldn't have a 2 here. Okay. Now, if I'm doing the same thing with the laser phase, not the phi laser, it turns out to be negative 2n squared on the recall t. And so the total phase is negative n squared omega recon t. Okay? And finally, this has been done without gravity. So if I turn on gravity and those trajectories fall, then I'll get a contribution plus n k g t times t plus t prime here. And now I have to Find t prime, that's this interval. And this is t in here. Okay. So what's that good for? Um, I wouldn't use I wouldn't use this one to measure gravity because it's more complicated and it has a worse signal to noise than this one, right? Because I'm losing half the atoms to useless outputs. So I will use this only if it gives me a benefit, and the benefit is I can now measure this term, which contains the combination h bar over m, the ratio of the Planck constant and the atom mass. So the ramsey bordet interferometer is useful for measuring h bar over m, but only if I know gravity, right? Turns out this term isn't small. It's actually usually much larger than the first term. So it seems I can measure h bar over m, provided I'm interested in it, only if I already know gravity. But gravity varies all the time. It varies at the seventh decimal place with a 12-hour period from the moon orbiting. Right? So that's where these extra outputs come in. Let's make use of them. And I'll try to 
recombine them up here. Okay? That doesn't work by itself. To make these extra outputs recombine up here, I need to send in extra laser beams that are resonant with the Raman or Bragg transitions here. But let's skip, set this technological thing aside. Okay. If I do that, what happens is I'm turning the plus sign here into a minus sign. And so if I run both atom interferometers at the same time, and measure the phase, I can determine the sum and the difference of the two phases. And that way I can cancel the gravity term out and keep only the recall frequency. Okay? Why would I want to do this? Who's interested in H bar over M, right? Wouldn't it be much more interesting to measure H bar or measure mass? That's something you, you know what it means, why H bar over M. There's two things to note about that. First of all, the Schrodinger equation, the way you usually write it is something like this, right? So I'm canceling the H bars here, and then you see that the fundamental constant that's really in the Schrodinger equation is H bar over M, not H bar, not M, right? The second use of it is to take a look at the hydrogen atom. Um, in a quantum mechanics course, you would say the Bohr energy is the Rydberg constant, which is a wave number. So I'm turning it into a frequency by multiplying it with the speed of light. And I'm turning it into an energy by multiplying it with the Planck constant. Okay? That's one way to write the energy of a hydrogen atom in the ground state. The high energy people would probably say, no, this is one half MEC squared times the fine structure constant squared. This relationship, by the way, holds exactly by definition of the Rydberg constant. So you would say that the real hydrogen atom has a lamp shape and a fine structure and so on. Sure, it does. But the Rydberg constant is defined so that the equality here holds exactly. Okay. I can solve that for alpha, the fine structure constant, and what I would get is 2 times the Rydberg constant over C times h bar over m electron. There's h bar over m again, in this case with the electron mass, and now I have a fantastic tool to measure the fine structure constant, because the Rydberg constant is by far the best known fundamental constant the one that we have measured with the lowest inaccuracy. The ratio of the Planck constant to the electron mass cannot be measured by the atom interferometer, but I can measure the ratio of the Planck constant to the atom mass, and then the penning trap guy can tell me the ratio of the atom mass to the electron mass. So those ratios are known to better than part per billion precision. So if I only measure this one, I get the fine structure constant. That's the whole reason to do that. Okay, and with that, I want to go more experimental. And so we're going to replace the whiteboard by the projector. But at this point, do you have questions? Yeah. Uh, what if we introduce the gradient variable? What's oh? That is a very complicated piece. Uh, Actually, but that's a very good question. Let me answer a broader question. Um, each time I add a new interaction, let's say gravity is not exactly constant, but gravity of reality is a little weaker here than it is here, right? On the, that's about on the seventh decimal place. We're trying here to measure on the tenth decimal place, so those changes are important. Very good question, right? Uh, how do I calculate that? It turns out that I can use some sort of perturbation theory. If my Lagrangian changes a little bit due to addition of a new potential, such as a gravity gradient, I can evaluate the phase change by integrating the new term over the old trajectories. Okay? And that will be a good approximation so long as the new term is small, just like a regular perturbation. 
So the way to evaluate the effect of a small perturbation on the phase is to use the old trajectories, but to integrate the new term along these. Okay. If I do that, then yes, I get a gravity gradient term here, and I get a gravity gradient term here. And the effect of that I will show in the experimental data because it's an important systematic effect in the measurement. Is that satisfactory <laughs> explanation? Then? I don't really remember what the function of form is. That's why I won't write it here. Yeah? Why sometimes you use pi pulse and sometimes pi over 3 units? Why only pi over 2? Um, if I had a pi pulse here, then I would set the lower arm in motion, which I want to avoid. But I want to measure the contribution of the kinetic energy to the phase. And that means I must keep this lower arm at rest. And since both arms see the same laser light, the only way to give this a probability to stay at rest is to use pi over 2 pulses throughout. That's unfortunate, but there's no better way that I know. Uh -huh. So there's another pair of values, isn't there? Is there any use of that? And it's actually like, you mean oh these yeah, ones that go down? Um, well, there's one that goes horizontal from the top, and there's one that goes down from the bottom. Yeah, and then just throw away. We have never used them, but I'll show one slide. So I don't know of a completely lossless country um, way to make Ramsey for days, but you can get creative and shuffle them around, and I'll show a slide on such an idea. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first question is why would I want to spend a lot of time and money to measure the fine structure constant? And here's my slide here, the error of precision uncertainty. What I mean by that is that we have a fantastic standard model of particle physics, but loud and clear signals from the skies tell us that it's incomplete. There's dark matter, there's dark energy. Together, they make up 96% of the mass of the universe, and we have no idea what they are. Our beautiful standard model works here. Our terrestrial <coughs> detectors have not found any signature for physics beyond the standard model, not dark matter, not dark energy, not anything else, right? So there's clearly a need here for more experiments. Let me show you this graph. This is how dark energy was detected. Now, this is not going to be a cosmology lecture, don't worry. Um, you've seen it before, probably. In the early 90s, it was obviously known that the universe had started in a big bang. It was expanding, but it has mass, so there's gravity. And this gravity is going to slow down the expansion of the universe and eventually, perhaps, lead to contraction if the gravity is strong enough, is strong enough to a standstill if you're exactly at some sort of critical mass, or continued but slowing expansion, but definitely slowing in all three cases. And this should be measurable. So in the early 90s, this part of the data was known. What's shown here is um, observations of supernova star explosions. And those star explosions have pretty much the same brightness whenever they occur, because they occur at similar periods in the star's evolution. If I measure the brightness of such a supernova on the ground, that tells me how far away it is from the Earth. So this um, vertical axis is a distance axis. If I measure the redshift of the supernova, that tells me how fast it is moving away from the Earth. So that's the speed axis. So I have here distance versus speed. But the distance of a light year means that the light is one year old. So what I also have here is a time versus speed axis. Okay? So in some sense, the vertical axis is age, and the horizontal axis is speed. Okay? So what happens is, if the universe is accelerating, is expanding at a constant rate, then you expect all the data to lie on a diagonal line on this graph. And this is how the data looked like in the early 90s. It was exactly on the diagonal, indicating no change in the expansion rate of the universe. 
Um, people knew that this couldn't be right because of gravity. And so those days, Rich Miller and Sal Perlmutter had an idea to extend this graph. They essentially looked at sky surveys with a computer and identified supernova by computer so they could gather more data instead of looking at the images by eye. Right? That takes long. So they had more supernova could extend this graph by one order of magnitude and found that the preponderance of evidence was that the universe is speeding up, not slowing down. Completely unexpected. There was no theory that would anticipate this. Probably they even had to argue why anyone would do such a boring measurement of something that can be calculated using Newton's gravity. Right? Anyway, the reason I like to show this is in the spirit of this morning's lecture, we need to prime atomic physics precision measurements for discovery. And this graph shows that sometimes doing something an order of magnitude better can be the key to an important discovery as here. The significance starts here, the higher redshift, right? For now, let's take it just as evidence for the fact that the standard model is incomplete. Um, here are several measurements of the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant has been measured using methods from all over physics, right? For example, you can actually measure the fine structure of helium, and I'm afraid this data point is missing here. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. So you can measure the fine structure constant by measuring the fine structure of atoms, right? You can use muon ion. You can um, use the quantum Horn effect from solid state physics. But the most accurate measurements are either measurements like that done with rubidium by the group of Francois Biramet, that's now led by Saida um, Guilati and Pierre Clade. They have measured H over M rubidium and determined the fine structure constant to an accuracy of two-thirds of a part per billion. A similar measurement, very old with cesium, was done in the Chu group and has a larger error bar. And then the most accurate of them all is measuring how strong a magnet the electron is. So the electron has a magnetic moment. It's two Bohr magnetons, but it's a tiny bit larger. And the difference of the g factor in 2, g minus 2, is a function of the fine structure constant that you can calculate using almost the entire standard model of particle physics. Let me show this, actually. Okay. So, these are, this is a summary of the contributions of various parts of the standard model to the calculation of G minus G. The bulk is the first order quantum electrodynamics. Then there's a second order, third order, fourth order, and fifth order. By now we're talking about more than 10,000 Feynman diagrams that have to be evaluated. At the current accuracy, even that isn't enough, and you have to go beyond QED and include the muon and several types of hadrons that also shift the value of g minus 2 around. And the accuracy of the measurements is not very far from the point where you would need to know about the tau and the weak interaction. Okay. The bottom line is lots of things have to be correct if the comparison of g minus 2 experiment and theory works out. More than 10,000 Feynman diagrams have to be evaluated correctly. The muon and those hadrons have to be understood correctly. And two experiments have to be right. So this is a great check of the overall consistency of the standard model and experiment. Now you see that G minus 2 gets moved around by existing virtual particles that we know about. So maybe it gets moved around by, existing, by virtual particles that we don't know. That's the whole spirit here, right? OK, very often in physics, you have something that's extremely well calculated, but it's not very well measurable. But in this case, everything works out. Fine structure constant can be measured very accurately with plasma interferometry. The calculation is very accurate. And 
Jerry Gabriels is able to measure G minus 2 to very high precision. So this is a fantastic test case for not just QED, but the entire standard model. This is the equation I've already derived from the board. Now, how to do this? Well, I want to say, let's build a Ramsey Boyday estimate from it. And just to show you how marvelous a tool this is, let's do it in a more primitive way. And let's just say, all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit my atom with a photon. <coughs> it's going to start moving. And I'm measuring the energy of this motion, the kinetic energy after the atom has been hit with a photon. That's what I want to measure. That would be a measurement of h bar over m. But the problem is this energy shift is just 2 kilohertz, right? So if I want to resolve this at all on top of the 10 to 14 or so hertz of optical laser frequency, I have to get an accuracy of 10 decimal places just to see that there is such an energy. And I would have to get an accuracy of 10 to the minus 22 to measure it the state of the art pre um, precision. And this is obviously not possible. Okay. In a sense, this was a very stupid way of doing it. Um, it's like measuring the height of the grass of the Empire State Building by measuring first the Empire State Building from the street level and then from the street level to the top of the grass, subtracting the two, right? That's what we've been trying to do. The ramsey bordet interferometer solves this problem and immediately gains me 10 orders of magnitude of signal to noise by canceling the optical frequency, right? This is the phase shift, you've derived it here. Now you ask, why is there a factor of 8 here that I have ignored here? The thing is, my n here is defined by the number of photons, whereas here is the number of photon pairs. There's a slight confusion here. Sorry about that. Um, here's the gravity term, right? OK, so that cancels 10 orders of magnitude of signal that I don't want. And then here are the two interferometers that I've already talked about. If I run both atom interferometers, then this gravity term requires a minus sign and I can cancel it. That gets rid of the gravity term and doubles the useful term. So it has two um, useful effects. Now you see this last term, 2n omega mt. What's that? The way I'm measuring interference fringes, I can measure interference fringes in two ways. Right? What I'm really doing is not measuring an extremely large phase, but instead I'm phase shifting my laser beams by ramping their frequency in such a way that I get this additional phase term here. And then I'm adjusting omega m until the overall phase is zero, which I can verify by checking that this overall phase does not change when the capital T is changed. Okay? So I'm trying to convert the phase measurement into a low measurement so that I don't need to worry about very systematic effects. So conceptually, you can ignore this, but for conducting the measurement, this is important. Okay. Now there's a problem. The problem is if I make the experiment extremely sensitive, it will also measure the vibrations very with high sensitivity. And those vibrations will generate so much space that I can't see the fringes anymore. This doesn't look like a sine wave, correct? But I can now do a parametric plot with the fringes of the lower interferometer and the upper on the x and y axis, and together they will form an ellipse. The shape of the ellipse is given by the difference of the two phases. That's the signal I want to measure. Which point on the ellipse I get any time I run the experiment is given by the vibrations. So I just let this run, plot an ellipse, fit the shape, and that gives me a estimate for the phase of the interferometer, and then I can convert that into my recoil frequency measurement. That's what's going on here. 
At this point, I want to ask a question. We've done this experiment with cesium, and very often I get asked, why cesium? Cesium has a high mass. That means the recoil frequency is small. Isn't that weird? Wouldn't I want to use an atom of low mass to get a higher signal, right? And we have tried that. The big problem there is that the lighter an atom, the faster it moves after you cool it with your standard laser cooling setup. There are two reasons for that. First, even at the same temperature, a light atom moves faster. And that's not good because I need a sub-recoil sample, right? And second, um, those light atoms has less of a hyperfine splitting. I'm thinking in particular of lithium, which has an unresolved hyperfine splitting, and that means the standard laser cooling methods don't work quite as well. So we worked very hard to make an atom interferometer with light atoms that are unfortunately hot. So this is um, slides I've stolen from a drag student K day. Everything is here. Together they have done this, right? The point is, can I make a sensitive lithium atom interferometer without having a cold sample, not even below the recoil temperature? The advantage is obvious. The lithium atom has a much larger velocity when I kick it, and therefore much larger kinetic energy. That gives me more signal. We're talking about factors of 30 here, OK? So this is not negligible. The problem is this. I like my two interferometers to cancel gravity and vibrations. But I'd like to be able to read them out separately. Right? Now, what's the difference between the two interferometers? Just the way they move in space. And that motion is given by some multiple of the recoil velocity. The velocity comes from taking the atoms with a photon. But that means if the initial velocity of the atom cloud has a distribution that's broader than a couple of recoil velocities, then those two outputs will overlap. And that's exactly what's happening with lithium. So here are these two um, atom interferometers again. Now imagine that these two paths are smeared out by the thermal motion of the atoms so that they, in fact, overlap and I can't detect them separately. The only thing I can still detect separately if I use Raman beam splitters is if they are in a different internal state. But that gives me just two independent measurements. And to read out the two interferometers separately, I need four. So there's a lack of information. What happens now is that the interference fringes um, there we go, of the two interferometers as superimposed. And what we get is this type of pattern. Okay? So I now have two characteristic scales in here. One is the envelope function, the slow variation, and what's the, um, call it the carrier wave or whatever, the fine variation, right? But it turns out that I can perform, so this is the functional form of it, right? There is a recoil frequency term in here, there's gravity in here, and then there's a laser term delta that I can tune around. And by tuning the delta, I could, for example, park my interferometer here and adjust the delta for maximum contrast there. And then I can perform a recoil sensitive atom interferometer with light atoms, even though they are hot, so I get a very large signal. I do not need to bother with evaporative cooling or something that slows down the experiment. And I still get the cancellation of gravity. Okay, so that seems too good to be true, and in some sense it is, but it is the first time that I personally have tried out or not me, the group has tried out something different, right? It's a new thing. Um, the recoil frequency in here is 60 kilohertz. That's a factor of 30 larger than um, with cesium. 
You will also note that the path separation time here is measured in milliseconds. So while the recoil frequency is larger, the time of flight is shorter. And so the advantage is not all that obvious at this point. This is a first step, so to speak. Okay, let's go back to the cesium measurement with which we have finally performed the precision measurement. Uh, we already talked about rack diffraction. And I left out some interesting stuff that we can talk about at lunch at dinner that I want to get us to bring up. Right? The stuff that I've talked about so far will get you about nine decimal places of alpha, but we want the tenth. And so we need to make it ten times better. And what we do here is inserting so called block oscillations at the center. Suffice it to say that this is a nice way to pull the two atom interferometers apart and accelerate them to a very high velocity. We're talking about the momentum of up to 800 photons here. Okay? And that will replace one of the n's inside that n square by an n plus big N, where the big N is the number of blocks oscillations, which is very large, and therefore I get a very large phase. That increases my signal by another factor of 10 and should give me the 10th digit of the recall frequency. Let's skip a couple of bragging slides. Here's the setup, right? So generating a sample of cold atoms here. The atoms move up in this magnetically shielded tube. All this has to happen in free fall and is therefore limited to times below about 1 point something seconds. If you want it longer, then you need to build it taller. In practice, this is never a problem for us because if you look at the signal that just goes linearly with the pulse separation time, but systematic effects such as the gravity gradient that you asked her about, that goes like T cubed. So I actually don't want to run this at long T. I want to run this at the shortest T that gives me enough signal, but not longer. Because if I go even longer, the gravity gradient starts to win. Here's how it looks like in the lab. Um, what you see here is essentially the lasers for the magneto-optical trap. The lasers that generate the Bragg pulses are on a different optical table. And then this is what the signals look like. So look at this graph and turn on gravity again. If I turn on gravity, then those interferometer outputs will start falling down after a while. And when they've fallen down, they move past a detector where we simply detect fluorescent light. Okay? There are two interferometers, each with two outputs, so I get four outputs that I need to detect. And you see them here. These are two useful outputs. These are the two other useful outputs. This here in the middle are junk atoms that have been launched but do not take part in the atom interferometer. The upper graph is without no oscillations. The lower graph is with 200 no oscillations. So you see that the no oscillations are not infinitely efficient, meaning if we run a lot of them, we lose signal to noise, but we gain signal from the big factor of capital N, so it's still a good thing. And then if you take the four outputs and you plot the ellipses, so as the pulse separation time goes up, the signal to noise gets a little burst. But on the other hand, the phase goes up, so you're still winning. And then there's an important component of any precision measurement that makes it a little bit more exciting and a little bit more credible. You need to blind yourself. Because you don't want to be biased and stop measuring when your number seems to agree to what you expect. So what we did here is Part of the data analysis code was sent to Rana Adhikari, he's a LIGO guy at Caltech, and we asked him to add a random number and send us the compiled code back. So the only way we could figure out what the random number is is either to uncompile it and I'm not a computer person, I can't do that, or ask Rana. <laughs> okay. 
So, um, however, we asked them to pick the random number in a certain range, and so for several months of the data taking campaign, this is all we knew about our result. It was somewhere in this interval, which the good news is includes previous values, but we could still be off by several sigma. Okay, and then you do your systematic analysis. So this is the total error budget. Lots of numbers here. Let's separate that in big and new. The big terms are obviously the laser frequency. That we have to control by using a frequency code, monitor or frequency reference every once in a while. Acceleration gradient, that's the gravity gradient you were asking about. It's a big term. We have to run the atom interferometer specifically to measure the gravity gradient. So we've built a gravity gradiometer in our lab to measure that. And the third one is the Goy phase. This is why initially I emphasized that the momentum of a photon is not h bar omega over c. It is h bar omega over c for plane wave, but a real laser beam is never a plane wave. So you get a deviation, which is called the Goy phase. That's the single largest contribution to the error budget, and we need to measure the beam precisely to estimate it. The nice thing is the big systematic effects aren't new. They have plagued atom interferometers forever, so we know exactly how to deal with them. The new systematic effects are because we were the first to use multi-photon Bragg diffraction. That gives us the factor of n squared here, which is good. But it also gives us those diffraction phases that I mentioned, which nobody before us had studied in this system, so we had to study it ourselves. Fortunately, they turned out to be small. Okay, that's a good thing. Let me just give you a taste. The last systematic effect to show you what's really relevant here. This is really stuff you couldn't invent. You have to do the experiment and struggle with it for a long time to figure out that this even matters. The laser beam out of an optical fiber is roughly Gaussian in the middle, but not Gaussian far away from the center. Instead, it becomes more Lorentzian far away from the center. That doesn't really hurt us a lot, but this light scatters at the vacuum chamber walls and comes back to the center from reflection then interferes with the main beam and causes trouble. So for a long time, our fine structure constant was a function of how long we let the atoms fly. Right? This is the pulse separation time, and the vertical axis is the fine structure constant. And the red graph is typical for what we measure for years. Looking back now, I've seen this in 2007 at Stanford as a postdoc. I didn't know what it was at the point. Right? Those days I was happy that Bragg diffraction works at all. The solution was to make the beam more Gaussian by installing this apodizing filter. So there was no radiation scattering at the chamber walls anymore, but the problem was fixed. That was the hardest to fix because there's really no equation that tells you to look for it. Then you don't trust yourself and you run checks. Lots of we have data where we verify the number of block oscillations. Does that change off a lot? Doesn't. The power of the laser beam. We purposely make the contrast of the measurement worse and check if that changes the result. No, it doesn't. And so on and so on and so on. Right? Lots of checks. I have figures for each of them when I'll spare you. And then you ask yourself what could happen? What could be the possible outcome if we unbind? And we find agreement, great, stand up on this thread. What if it doesn't agree? Um, there's a so-called dark photon, which is really just a photon but with mass. Um, it's one of the possible extensions of the standard model that have been considered. And this one has been considered a lot because there are a number of experimental hints for it, such as the measured deviation of the muon's gyromagnetic ratio between theory and experiment. There's a 3.6 sigma signal that has been persistent for years and years and years. And that could be naturally explained by a dark photon. There are other 
possible hints from that. Dark photons are being searched by collaborations that have published papers on dark photons. And this is the experimental situation. Here's the dark photon mass. And here's the dark photon coupling constant. And the red region is where you would explain the muon anomaly. And all the other colored regions of the chart are ruled out by accelerator experiments. OK. And then you unblind. So here is data taken <coughs> over several months. Each um, point is approximately 24 hours of data. The statistical sensitivity of our measurement is so good that 12 hours of data would be sufficient. But we ran the experiment many times, scanning through parameters such as the pass separation time and so So each point is really going through lots of parameters, different values for the pass separation time and so on, to make sure that nothing varies that should not vary. That's why it takes so much data. And then you have light. You've seen this slide before. So this is us. We're slightly more accurate than Jerry Gabriel's. This is 0 0.20 parts per billion as opposed to 0.24. Atom interferometry is consistent with itself. That's the um, good news. The other news is that it's not fully consistent between atom interferometry and G minus 2. So this is 2.5 sigma. That's not close enough to call it agreement, and it's not far enough to call it evidence for new physics, right? So the standard nomenclature for such a situation is there's a tension in the data. You don't really want to call it agreement, you don't want to call it disagreement. There's tension, right? What could this tension mean? Well, let's first look at the shear sensitivity. These are, again, the contributions of the various standard model terms to the electron star magnetic anomaly. This is the previous alpha accuracy. This is the current alpha accuracy. And the red dotted line is the G minus 2 accuracy. For the first time, the comparison is accurate enough to verify the fifth order quantum hydrodynamics in this comparison. Okay? That's a big deal because this. Comparison is one of the reasons that physicists are so confident in the standard model. Then let's look at what it means for dark photons. This is the graph I've just shown you, and this is where we lie. It is just so slightly better than the accelerator constraints in this region here, right? I think that's a good sign because. Any way we get better from here on will be a larger deal, big better than the accelerator constraints. And this is really an example for tabletop physics doing work that is traditionally in the realm of particle physics. It's a specialized thing, sure. We are not running the LHC, we're not driving the LHC out of business, right? But it's a way of doing serious particle physics with atomic physics methods. Um, now, the dark photon explains the G minus 2 anomaly but for the muon that produces the wrong sign for our statistic. A different particle that is almost a dark photon but produces the opposite sign of the tension is compatible with our data. And you see that this region is ruled out by us, the other region is ruled out by many people. There's one globally allowed region, which is this one. And it is even favored by some anomalous observations in pion decay. So let's say there's some sort of confluence of evidence that there might be something going on in this region. I can't say whether this signifies anything. Certainly, our statistical significance is too small to make a big claim. Right? I guess theorists will study this, and then we'll know more. Okay, with this I want to um, close. I just want to thank the people that have worked very, very hard on this measurement for years. Richard Parker just had a baby today. Um, Cheng Wei was and Wei Chen were the grad students. Brian was the grad student who started this at Berkeley, and he graduated um, 
not long ago, Beijing and Shenzhen were the most famous places. Okay. So that's what I have about measuring the time spectrum past that. So you want to keep us from dinner. <laughs> Yeah. 